Good morning, Grand Erie parents and caregivers. We are thrilled that you were able to join us today for our webinar on coping with uncertainty, a webinar for parents. I'd like to begin by introducing myself. I'm Christine Bibby, the lead for Safe and Inclusive Schools. And with me on the call today, I have Julie Selden Hall, who is our Safe Schools social worker, and Tanya Haste, who is a child and youth worker for Safe Schools. And today, the three of us want to welcome you, and uh, we're thrilled to be here, as I said, to provide an opportunity to talk about coping with all of the uncertainty that's affecting all of us. We did a similar presentation with staff a couple of weeks ago, and we found that it's a conversation that everybody's having. What we want to start with today, though, is letting you know what we can't provide. So unfortunately, today we can't provide a clear picture of what school is going to look like going forward. We do know that the Ministry of Education, along with the other ministries, such as the Ministry of Health, are working on this. And on a call yesterday, what I heard the minister Ministry of Education say is that what they're understanding and prioritizing right now is that student mental health and well-being is something that we're going to have to keep in mind as we move forward and it's something that's challenging for all of us. So just trying to move my PowerPoint through here for you having a little technical difficulty. So what we're gonna to cover today, the psychology of our response to the pandemic. So I think it's important for us to understand the impact on all of us. And as I said, this won't just be for our students, but ourselves and also people around us. Julie's going to talk with you about acceptance and permission. Tanya will talk about coping and thriving. We'll also talk about parenting during COVID and what are some of the things that you might need to keep in mind and some of the things that might be helpful to you. And also where are the places in the school and the community that you can seek support. We know that you and your family are being challenged to manage a lot right now. So there is a little bit of humor through this presentation. But what we want to say is if you do have questions throughout this presentation, you can put them in the chat and we will answer those at the end. And what we want to prioritize is our mental health and the mental health of our children. So it's hard to believe it was only March when all of this started. It feels like it's been forever and a lot has changed. One of the things that we know when we look at the psychology of fear and anxiety is that many of us are reacting in ways that are quite normal and under a crisis situation or when the brain feels a threat, it's normal to have a fight, flight or freeze response. And that's an automatic response. And we're seeing this around us in people's behavior in the beginning, especially when people were stocking up on supplies. And we also see some people rejecting uh, being concerned about it and that might be their coping. So a wide range of impact. We also know that the reduced social contact has had implications for all of us and particularly our children and teenagers. So we have to consider that. And being in a global impact zone, as I said, it's not just us and our families that are affected, but it's everyone around us. And yet, while we're in the same storm, we are in different boats. So some of us have unique challenges that we're dealing with, along with trying to be teachers at home, as well as perhaps looking after elderly parents and dealing with other stressors in your life. So we know that under a crisis situation, usually things that were stressful before that situation occurred will be intensified. So for example, if you were dealing with physical health issues, mental health issues, if there were stressors in your family or your children were dealing with things, those things are now intensified. And that makes it so much more difficult for us to manage the entirety of the situation. 
as well. We are getting a lot of different messages on social media, in the news, uh, in conversation, through our professional relationships. We're hearing many different things and many sources of information, sometimes not in agreement with one another. So that makes it confusing. So there's no roadmap for this and we have to think in a situation when things feel so out of control, what are the things that we can control? And one thing that we like to talk about when we consider this is that often as human beings, we become very focused on the macro and, and the macro is the bigger picture around us. So in, in terms of the pandemic, that would be reading news about, thinking about and being uh, uh, very um, up on all of the details of how the impact is affecting the world in terms of the pandemic. So that's reading lots of news about it and articles and stories and maybe immersing ourselves in that broader picture of, of this impact. And what tends to happen when human beings focus solely on that is that they feel overwhelmed and they feel powerless and helpless. So often the better thing to do is start to turn in and look at the micro picture. So where are the places and spaces in my life where I can make a difference? Uh, who are the people that need my support? So in my situation, for example, I have two elderly parents and that is where I put my energy during this time. So for you, it's looking at what do your children need and what do you need as a parent as you try to balance out all of these competing demands? And in light of that, we want to say to you, we know that you as parents on the call today, you're doing your best and this is a crisis education situation. It's not the same as an online learning platform that was introduced slowly and with lots of support and lots of uh, education beforehand so that all of us knew how to use the platforms. We've all been muddling through it together and it wasn't something that any of us anticipated, so we weren't ready for this shift. So we want to say that we appreciate the stress that is brought into your lives and certainly have heard from parents who've talked about the difficulty that they've had engaging their student, their children. And we want to say to you that we know you're doing your best and that in light of that, we want you to focus instead on your wellness, the wellness of your children and on how you can be creative and cope and survive during these difficult times. And we know from research that the greatest mitigator of the impact of stress and crisis and trauma is the power of connection. So here's an interesting picture of uh, the changes that perhaps COVID have brought to our lives. I know for my team, we've talked about makeup as being the replacement for uh, shaving. So if you could see us today, you could see that we do have makeup on. Over to you, Tanya, to talk about coping and thriving. OK, thank you, Christine. Um, so coping and thriving, if we look at the definitions for each of these words, to cope is to face and deal with responsibilities, problems or difficulties. And then to thrive means to grow or develop. So as Christine talked about, you know, what are the things that we can focus on uh, within our um, microsystems, our immediate family? And so we want uh, we want to take a look at coping as a continuum. Um, and we know that, uh, you know, say back on uh, March 13th, when we had the news that we were headed off for March break and that school was going to be closed for an additional two weeks, um, there was lots of um, anxiety and stress, stress and uh, significant uncertainty. Routines were um, not uh, the same as uh, they were prior to March break. And as we've uh, grown and adjusted over these last couple of months, um, you've probably had peaks and valleys um, of, you know, today's a good day, tomorrow is not such a good day, um, and that's okay. And one of the things that uh, we need to focus on is our self-care and what we have control over. So we're going to talk a little bit more uh, on the next slide about these basic needs and how we can meet them. Boundaries are so important. And I know for uh, us in our home, trying to adjust to uh, people being home from post-secondary, people being home from work, school, 
and things like that. Trying to carve out time for independent time, time to be together. How do we do schoolwork and work all at the same time? Uh, how do we have adult conversations uh, when everybody is around all of the time? And so these boundaries um, are very important and uh, trying to find the time uh, and space individually for ourselves and our family um, has been a challenge. Media exposure, and, uh, whether it be through television or social media, Christine spoke to this and, and competing information and that who is it that we, we trust? Where um, are the sources of information coming from? I know in the beginning, one of the things for me is I wanted a lot of information. I wanted to be in the know. I wanted to know what decisions were being made. And I spent a lot of time uh, watching the news. But one of the things that I quickly realized is what I needed wasn't uh, actually what other people in my home needed. Um, and so what was happening was that when I would have the TV on and the news on, I was by myself. People didn't want to sit in the living room with me or didn't want to be within earshot um, because it wasn't what they needed um, because the exposure to all of that information was more anxiety provoking. And so I had to reflect on myself and how I could, again, with boundaries, get what I needed to help uh, make me feel uh, grounded uh, but also appreciating what it is other people within my home needed. Christine, could you advance the slide, please? Thank you. And so when we look at our basic needs and what we have control over, and so, you know, We've all uh, been forced into a situation uh, that none of us had control over, and it's had uh, varying impacts on uh, different people. So for some of us, uh, you know, we were laid off. Uh, for some of us, we're working from home. For some of us, we've had to take leaves in order to care for our children or to care for elderly parents. Um, and so how is it that we're taking care of our basic needs in these times? Um, of difficulty. So healthy food and housing, you know, the way that we grocery shop um, has has changed. Uh, you know, running to the store for two items uh, isn't the way that uh, we're doing business anymore. Face to face contact uh, has been minimized. You know, we've had we have to keep our distance, but just because we're physically distant doesn't mean we need to be socially distant. So there's so much creativity out there uh, where people have, uh, you know, things like the birthday parades or celebrations, uh, connecting over uh, platforms like this, uh, FaceTime uh, through Facebook Messenger and things like that. People are being very creative. Uh, some people have gone back to letter writing. Um, so trying to uh, stay connected to people because as humans, we're social, you know, we're we're wired to connect with others. And so it's very important uh, for us to be able to have those experiences uh, in a way that provide us with fulfillment um, and a sense of belonging with others. Uh, as the weather starts to get better, more people are uh, moving to the outdoors for physical activity. And we've had, uh, you know, things kind of taken away from us. So I'm from uh, the Norfolk community, and one of the things uh, within Norfolk that had been difficult for our community is that our trails and parks and things like that uh, were closed. And so I know that uh, that was a real struggle for people, uh, having to avoid the places where they may have uh, otherwise looked for uh, some sanctuary uh, and some space. Uh, they struggled when those things were closed. Now, in the last couple of weeks, those things have opened um, and more and more people are uh, out and about and respecting, for the most part, uh, the social distancing that's required in order to keep ourselves safe. With sleep, sleep is so important. And so our routines have been completely changed. And so for families with, with young kids, um, you know, sleep patterns and routines may still uh, be the way they were prior to March break. For those of us with adolescents and teenagers, we may have seen the shift to uh, the way summer sleep patterns happen. 
And so what we need to be aware of, and even for ourselves, is that too little sleep or too much sleep is going to affect our ability uh, to function. Right, so if we're, if we're sleep deprived, for instance, uh, our ability to cope uh, with the day's tasks, the things in front of us is gonna be more difficult. And then as I spoke to earlier, that we are uh, creatures that require connection. And so we want to belong, we wanna have a purpose um, and meaning. And so for those, for some of us, it, it's within our job. For some of us, we've, uh, you know, our connection to community has changed. And so we're having to move to other ways of being with uh, those people and those activities that give us belonging and purpose. Can we move to the next slide? Sorry, ladies, Sorry, having ladies. difficulty. <laughs> this is a new platform for us, so there are a few kinks we're working out. Maybe as she's looking to uh, switch over there and deal with the technology, one of the things. Um, that we, we are gonna talk about uh, as we continue to move forward is healthy stress. And all of this situation has brought on a level of stress uh, that at times may be healthy, but also can be unhealthy. But what we want you to remember that healthy stress uh, gives us uh, the ability to move forward and to grow. And so there are parts of stress that are good for us, right? But uh, stress that is extreme um, can be uh, debilitating and can have uh, consequences for us. And so another cute meme that says exercise, I thought you said extra fries. And so, you know, some days it is an exercise day and some days it is an extra, an extra fries day. Julie, over to you. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, acceptance and permission. Um, a lot of the advice that Tanya gave is great. Lots of good ideas there to help keep yourself and your family well. I don't know about you, but my self-care sometimes has a tendency to go out the window when I'm in times of stress. So I'm wondering if there's a reason I got this section. It might be some typecasting. I'm not sure. If you are looking at Facebook at all, which I am, it certainly looks like there are a lot of people that are doing really well with this. There's a lot of bread baking going on. There's a lot of crafts going on with kids, people learning to speak Latin, people learning hieroglyphics, all kinds of interesting things going on. And I think that sometimes that can make us feel bad about ourselves or feel like we are not doing quarantine right. We're not rock and quarantine out the way we'd like to. And it's really important to remember it's not a competition. We're all coping during a global pandemic and we're trying to look after our health and protecting other people's health, which is a big job in its own right and takes up a lot of uh, energy, psychological energy, um, physical energy. The purpose is not to come out of the other side of this, a newer, shinier version of yourself. Um, Christine had talked before about uh, the fight or flight mechanism that kicks in. And what that is, is that's your limbic system um, that's kicking in. And the problem with that is what tends to kick out is your frontal lobe. Um, your frontal lobe is where things like concentration, motivation, memory, and learning uh, take place. So something called an expectation gap develops. So it's the gap between what you think you should be able to do, what you hope you would do, um, and then what you are actually capable of doing. And that's not based on, you know, that you're being lazy or anything else. It's based on some brain research in terms of what's happening in our heads right now. So um, there are some things that you can do that are positive. Obviously, reduce the expectations on yourself. And that's kind of a theme through what we're talking about today is to reduce those expectations for yourself and your family. 
Um, things like play, listening to music, movement, these are all things that sort of um, help get some of that uh, overexcited limbic system to settle down a little bit. Um, the, so really, we're talking about flow with the experience, accept your feelings, give yourself permission to have good and bad days. We're all doing that. Some days you may feel really productive and then the next day you may feel that binging Netflix is what you need to do that day. We talk about uh, activities as being either intrinsic or extrinsic. Uh, intrinsic are behaviors we do simply for pleasure and tend to be the things that we tend to feel guilty about spending time doing. Um, extrinsic are things that we do for a gain, like learning those hieroglyphics. So it's partly giving yourself permission to do things that are simply for the pleasure of doing them, things like a puzzle, I think is the ultimate wonderful waste of time because, you know, you build the whole thing and you just break it up. There really is no gain that comes out of that other than that it's lovely and relaxing and it gives you um, a sense of accomplishment when you're finished. The other thing that's really important is that we are role modeling for our children um, that they don't have to be perfect. Um, and that they can persevere and come through this and that they are learning things like uh, resilience that should come through this. Um, I think a lot of times we feel badly if we are showing emotions in front of our kids, which is really hard because most of us um, or certainly some of us are dealing with our own anxiety. We're dealing with our own sadness about the losses um, for things that are, are going on and things we've had to give up. It's okay for your kids to see that. What you can be modeling for them is, you know, yes, I feel sad, um, but these are the things that I'm going to do to make myself better, or these are the things that um, make me feel good that I'm I'm uh, spending time doing, and then that's okay. So there are learning possibilities as you go through this um, for you and for your kids. We talk about radical self-acceptance, a concept I love, which is just the idea of accepting whatever is. So if it's a day to get stuff done, awesome. If it's a day to work on accepting yourself, that's okay too. Talk about the Corona Coaster. I loved this. The ups and downs of the pandemic. One day you're loving your bubble, doing workouts and baking sourdough. And then next you're crying, drinking wine for breakfast and missing people you don't even like. Thank you, Julie. I love the story about the puzzle. It's so true. I love so, puzzles. <laughs> so we know that parenting is a challenge or can be a challenge at the best of times. And I think as parents, we've had to be masters uh, at being agile and responding to our children's needs. We've had to adjust to developmental changes and life changes and family changes. So I think we, we have resilience and skills that uh, we don't even sometimes know about. However, there's no parenting playbook and there's no playbook on how do you support children through a pandemic because this is all new for us. And not to mention every child and family is unique and so there is no one fits all approach. But what we do know is that if we focus on what we can control, it will help us to do better. It'll help us to feel better. It'll help us to stay grounded and it'll help us to keep focused on the things that we can change. So how do we do that? Well, the main thing is staying calm and looking after yourself. And we've been talking about that. So if you think about back to the days when we could fly in airplanes and the stewardess would talk about putting your own oxygen, oxygen mask on first before you put the mask on of, of your children, that basic care model is what applies here. Be compassionate to yourself. Be kind to yourself as you would be to a, to a good friend. And Julie talked about the notion of lowering those expectations. And when we are in that frame of mind, what happens is we're more able to be compassionate to others. We're more able to uh, model empathy and kindness to our children. And perhaps then we can also stand back from the emotions of other people and not personalize those. And I know during this time of so much closeness, there are a lot of conflicts that have been developing between families and within relationships. 
And finally, building your own support work, support network and team is critical to your wellness. And finally, let go of the responsibility of worrying about things that you can't change. So just a little humor about uh, all of you who've had to slip into the role of teacher. So over to you, Tanya. OK, thank you, Christine. So now uh, we're going to shift into uh, the part of the presentation where we're going to spend some time talking about uh, maybe some of the behaviors, feelings, uh, experiences you might be seeing from your children and what is it we do about them? How do we manage those things? So boredom is one of them. And I know that uh, the shift from attending school every day, uh, being out in the community, uh, whether it's connected to community uh, activities, theater, dance, sports, um, things like that, uh, to the way our life, our lives look now is very, very different. And so for a lot of families, um, children may have been uh, and still experiencing a level of boredom. Um, and so boredom comes when we don't have sufficient stimulation. And so for all of us, adults included, we have periods of boredom. And so back to what Julie was talking about uh, around modeling. So, you know, if I'm bored uh, as an adult, talking about that and, and what is it that I do to uh, manage that boredom? I know some families have instituted, uh, you know, charts of uh, jobs and uh, chores and things like that, or creative jars of when I'm bored, uh, pick a piece of paper and uh, there's, you know, an activity on there. For some kids, when they're bored, you might hear I'm bored. For other kids, you may see it in behavior. So they might be looking for things to do or they might be acting out. So getting into more issues with siblings, um, you know, d destruction, uh, give it, trying to get negative attention from people. And so as we uh, move through this time right now, developing daily routines and activities are, are really important. Um, and so because our routines have shifted so much, um, the establishment of these new routines help to help kids to find rhythm, uh, help them to understand expectations, uh, and then allow them um, the, the opportunity uh, to experience some new things. The other thing with boredom is it's OK to be bored. Uh, if if the behavior of children um, is just that I'm bored, we want to encourage creativity. Uh, if with boredom comes uh, difficult behavior, then we also we need to step in and help to manage some of that. OK, Christine. So worries and anxiety. This may be the biggest thing that we are dealing with at this time. Um, levels of anxiety uh, are high all the time, potentially for individuals and then also on a societal level as well. Um, I think some of it, as Tony gave some great ideas and part of what I like to do is to just kind of do a constant evaluation of what helps. So she had talked about watching the news uh, or talking about it. And some of it is if you're doing that, you know, do some evaluation of does that make it better? Does that make it worse? Um, you know, what I'm finding is that there are certain things that watching um, definitely anything about states perhaps um, are things that cause me to have a lot of increased anxiety. So I avoid that things like alcohol. Um, if the lineups at the LCBO are any indication, a few of us are doing that. Um, and again, just evaluating, does it make it better? Does it make it worse? Exercise, everything. Look at whether it works or doesn't work. So what you might be seeing in your kids um, is uh, things like thoughts um, actually being expressed. And this is great if they're willing to say, you know, I'm worried about not seeing my friends. I'm worried about uh, what's happening with grandma and grandpa. I'm worried about what's happening in the world. And if they're being that open, um, that is a wonderful thing um, because then we're able to address it directly. 
the feelings that might come, sad, mad, worried, all of those things can be tied into anxiety. Uh, the behaviors that you might see, so regression, uh, acting as a younger child, there may be increased clinginess because um, they're wanting you to be around because you're the one that makes them feel safe. Um, problems with sleep, bedwetting, physical complaints, sore stomachs, headaches. What's important to realize about these things when they are connected to anxiety is that they're real for the child. There may not be an actual uh, physical reason for it, but they really are having the experience of the headaches and the sore stomach. So you don't want to be um, dismissive of that. The other thing with teens, you may see uh, that they're agitated, uh, disrespectful, defiant, sometimes withdrawn, or maybe leaning themselves towards using substances. So what we want to do in response to this is to validate their feelings, empathize with them and comfort them. What we don't want to do is dismiss their feelings. So they're trying to tell you that that uh, they're worried and sometimes that's uncomfortable for us. Um, we may say to the child, well, you shouldn't be worried. Um, you need to be a big boy and not worry about this, those sorts of things. And instead, we really do want to acknowledge what it is that they're talking about. Then we want to assure them that the world is a safe place, that yes, this is something we're dealing with, but overall it is a safe place. We want to say things to them, um, potentially. There are a lot of people that are working to protect us. Uh, doctors are working on it. Hospitals are helping the people that are sick and most people get better. So there are lots of things we can say to reassure our kids and that's really important. Uh, also avoid the avoidance. So support your child in facing their fears step by step rather than uh, not talking about them. There's some good open conversations that uh, will help your kids. We have uh, often uh, support animals uh, for people who are managing anxiety. Here we have a social distancing support cat. Thanks, Julie. So I'm gonna talk a bit about sadness and experiencing sadness is to be expected right now for all of us. I know certainly I've found myself feeling profoundly sad um, when I hear some of the experiences that people are having and the impact of the COVID virus. So certainly we may be experiencing sadness and we're entitled to feel that way. And so are our children and our teenagers. So what you might be seeing at home is some expression of that sadness from your children, actually articulating that they're feeling sad. They might be expressing feelings of guilt. You might be feeling guilty. I know certainly thinking about the healthcare workers and people who've had to continue in jobs where perhaps there's more risk for them can make a person feel guilty when perhaps they're being paid to work from home. There's also a sense of loss of pleasure or enjoyment when somebody is feeling sad. So you may see that either in behaviors from your kids or just an unwillingness to join into things that they used to like and just an overall sense of not being happy. As well, you might see behaviors and Julie talked a little bit about the notion of what we call psychosomatic and that's the idea that children will often have physical complaints that are real and, and yet they are coming from an emotional place. So sometimes sadness comes out as a sore stomach, a headache and other aches and pains. So we want to pay attention when kids are feeling sad. We want to normalize that if it is a response to something that you would feel sad about. And this is just validating and expressing, you know, this is sad and I feel sad too. We also want to co-regulate and sort of that physical contact with our kids, giving hugs, encouraging them to let go of emotion, encouraging them to cry. That's an important part of expressing and managing sadness. And also looking deeper into the sadness and thinking and reflecting on, you know, what is the purpose and, and meaning of all of this right now and where can we find 
the the good, the silver lining in in this whole situation. And so one of the things I've heard some people talk about is the opportunity to be together with your family and maybe the opportunity to see things differently or to try different things. So looking for those opportunities to cope with sadness, but also acknowledge that, you know, perhaps these are normal ways to feel given our situation. So just a reminder to our kids that, that it won't be forever, but it is right now. Over to you, Tonya. Okay, so anger and aggression. So anger is a secondary emotion and usually underneath anger is another emotion that's kind of fueling that anger. Uh, so we, we want to understand kind of what is underneath anger uh, to be able to help uh, individuals, whether it be our children, ourselves, or even adult friends deal with uh, that, that underneath part. So for some uh, people, you know, you might see them uh, lashing out. You might see physical aggression. For others, it could be verbal. Uh, yet others could be oppositional. So, you know, not agreeable, not following uh, through on things, uh, stubborn, withdrawing, things like that. So again, trying to get at that underneath, uh, underneath part of what is it that's causing you to be uh, aggressive uh, in your behavior, your thoughts uh, and your actions. One of the ways that we can help with this again is to is to validate. So if we feel that, you know, it might be about sadness, we can ask and people will tell us, right? Kids will say, no, I, I'm not sad. I'm, you know, and they will explain. Uh, we want to validate those feelings as we've talked about in the other, other slides and allow an opportunity for them to talk about what it's like from their experience and what that feeling is about. Uh, sometimes with anger, uh, people aren't able to uh, deal with uh, the anger that's in front of them right at that moment. So we need to give space, right? So respecting that uh, now is not the time. And I know as a parent, I have adolescence now, but when my kids were young, sometimes I would put myself on a timeout and that really threw them for a loop. But I knew that I wasn't in the right frame of mind uh, to be able to deal. Uh, and I was angry about something. And so I would take a break. So as an adult, giving yourself permission to take that break as well, um, because, you know, as a, a parents, we're being asked uh, to do a lot of things right now um, that we haven't, uh, the same level of expe expectation hasn't been placed on us uh, in the past around providing education and 24 seven entertainment and all of those things. The other piece of anger is sometimes it can get out of control. And so you know your children best. Um, and so if this is, you know, a level of anger uh, that you've seen from your children and, you know, you feel comfortable in helping to manage uh, and to deal with that level of anger, uh, proceeding it is what we should be doing as parents. But sometimes it gets out of control and we want to encourage people to not be afraid to call for help. Uh, in a couple of slides, we're going to talk about the services in our area uh, in Grand Erie that are available to help families and a lot of children's mental health services um, have uh, been given extra funds throughout this time um, to help support families, whether it be through mental health crisis lines and things like that. Um, because as Christine said earlier, we know that people are struggling and we know that children are struggling and we want to provide uh, all the support uh, that we can. So, Impulsivity and inattention are also some things that uh, we are likely to see with our kids. Um, I talked before, we've talked throughout this about the limbic system, that fight or flight response. Um, 
that has to do or affects sort of the functioning of the frontal lobe, which is part of what helps us uh, govern uh, and deal with impulsivity, making good choices. Um, people are looking at a uh, drop in the happy chemicals, uh, things like dopamine and adrenaline. A um, lot of us, a lot of our kids, um, may well be understimulated. They don't have a lot to do and not just it's not just them. It is their brain that is actually understimulated. Um, you may see them um, doing things to try and stimulate their brains, try and interact with others um, in perhaps annoying ways. Um, stop touching your brother, stop touching your brother. Um, so the other things that can uh, that kids can run towards is recreational screen time. And that is because that actually raises um, a child's level of dopamine and of adrenaline. Um, those are things that you may well see in teens, um, that they may be really on their phone all the time. Um, they may be engaging in drama because again, that's pretty exciting for the brain. Uh, risk taking, rule breaking, all of those sorts of things may be uh, linked to some of their uh, what's going on in their brains. Um, one of the things that I was thinking is, you know, we are having to behave in such incredibly uh, conscious and thoughtful and purposeful ways these days. So um, when I go out grocery shopping, um, I'm incredibly anxious when I'm doing that. Um, and, you know, the whole time I'm having to think, oh, don't don't touch that thing if you're not going to take that. And uh, wow, stay away from that person. And um, all of these sorts of uh, things that I'm having to do. Um, those are things that are sometimes quite difficult for kids to, you know, stick to that uh, behaving really purposefully. On top of it, uh, challenges around impulsivity. So uh, I even think shopping with my partner who is uh, pretty ADHD, um, I am constantly reminding him, don't touch that don't touch that. If you're not going to take that, don't touch it. Um, and uh, part of what I'm doing there is I'm sort of being the external brain for him. So I'm providing him with constant reminders, refocusing. Um, I think what's important is to realize that your kids aren't doing this purposefully, um, that really it may be some of that uh, impulsivity that's coming um, as a result of the fact that their frontal lobe may not be working as well as we'd hoped at this time. Um, so look at finding ways uh, to provide stimulation. Physical activity is a great one. Time in nature, music, all of these things stimulate the brain. Um, balance this with mindful quiet times. It's a great opportunity to help teach your kid to tolerate lower levels of stimulation. Our lives pre uh, present us with lots of stimulation and most of us are having a time with lower stimulation right now where we're being forced to slow down. Um, and that's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing to um, learn to have some downtime. There is value. We also would suggest um, some limits on uh, screen time. It, it isn't great for kids to be on that um, for lots of uh, hours during the day. Uh, and again, I've said they're going to move towards that um, in that attempt to stimulate their brain and get some of those happy chemicals. So you just want to be aware of how much time they're spending on those sorts of things and um, making sure that you kind of intervene if you're worried about the amounts of time they're doing that. So in line with what Julie was just talking about, we just wanted to put a note in here about online safety. One of the things that we work with quite a bit in safe schools is when our students get into difficulties online, and that can be through conflicts, through things they've posted or said about one another, uh, inappropriate photos. Uh, there's lots of ways that our students um, get into difficulties online. And we know right now with social isolation, we are going to have an increased time online with peers, and that might be adults as well. 
So what we know about the online space is that it tends to be unsupervised, unsupervised by adults. And often we only know after the fact that someone has been harmed or a problem has happened. And often this is because we don't understand or we're not familiar with some of the online tools or platforms that our children are using. So I would encourage you um, to get to know what social media sites your children are following, um, what kinds of things they are posting, um, you know, friend them on, on, their, on their Snapchat and get to know what it is that they do online. And I know this ch is challenging because often um, children don't, don't want us in that space, but we definitely want to give them an opportunity. So we, get to know more about their lives through understanding how they socialize online and that's a way we can stay closer to them. Just a final note here as well, uh, from time to time we have heard of situations in our Grand Erie community where adult predators have taken advantage of the online platforms as a way to lure our youth and that could include gaming sites as well as social media sites. So this does happen even in our communities. It's not a myth. It's not something that only happens in bigger cities. So that's why again we just want to be aware of what our kids are doing online. We've posted a couple of websites there that have excellent information if you're looking for further resources. One is protectchildren.ca, that's a Canadian organization. And the other one is School Mental Health Ontario. So the next, we're just going to talk a little bit now. Julie, I think your mic is on, by the way. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about when to seek help. So we've talked about the different emotions you might see. We've talked about the feelings that you might be experiencing. And, and certainly this is a question that's come up for a lot of people. When do I know that maybe things are beyond myself or what I can manage within my family, my friendship group, my support network? And what we would say is that seeking help for ourselves and our children is often based on a number of factors. And we would say the first most important one is safety issues. So if you have any concerns about safety in your homes, the safety of yourself, your children, um, that would be a time to consider looking for help. And that help could be, again, for yourself, it could be for your children. There are lots of resources in our communities available. We are going to provide some of the crisis supports, but there are many, many more besides the ones that we'll be sharing today. If there are thoughts of self-harm or harming others, this is also a time to seek help outside of your family. These could be situations that turn lethal and we don't want to underreact to our, our children talking about wanting to harm themselves or having thoughts about harming other people. The other time would be when our children and our youth ask for help. And as Julie mentioned in one of her slides, when children can articulate how they're th think, thinking and feeling, that's a wonderful thing. And we definitely want to pay attention when they're telling us outright what they need. So anytime a child or an adolescent asks you for counseling, asks you for help, we want to respond to that. The other time would be if you as a parent are feeling overwhelmed and you're feeling like you're at your breaking point, that's a time to ask for help. And finally, you know your child best. So if you feel that your child or youth is presenting with symptoms of distress that are beyond what you would normally expect from them with what you know about them, that would be a time to consider asking for help. In our school system, we're fortunate to have many school-based supports. And I can tell you that behind the scenes, school teams are still meeting, support staff are still providing support, and consultations are still happening throughout our board. And the best place to start here would be with your school principal or your learning resource teacher, if you've been in touch with her or him. And those are the people that are best positioned to assist with connecting you with the supports within the school and more broadly our system. 
So in terms of our broader system in Grand Erie, there are both systems and protocols in place for responding to crisis and mental health needs of students, as well as assessing risk. So I spoke earlier about when students may, might have thoughts of self-harm or harming others. Those are situations where we would have systems and protocols that will help those students. Currently, we also have our school social workers available to do well-being checks on students through a referral process. And again, if this is something that you feel that your child and yourself would benefit from, this is something that you can talk with your school principal about or the learning resource teacher. And finally, we want to assure you that all of the school reentry planning that will happen will focus on the health and the well-being of our students and staff. And that will include you as well. So today was our first attempt, I guess, not trying to electronically connect with you. We, we're happy that you stayed with us and you had the patience in spite of the glitches. But this might be a forum for us to additionally continue to offer support to our families. These are some of the agencies in our Grand Erie community that provide support. Many of them aren't offering face-to-face -face meetings, but they are continuing to offer both crisis support by phone or virtual care support by video conferencing. So if you're in the Brantford area, that would be the St. Leonard's Crisis Response, and they are available 24-7. Similar to Haldeman Nor Norfolk Reach crisis. They are also 24-7. The Haldeman Norfolk cast team is for older uh, students, so 16 years and up, and that can be accessed as well. And the Six Nations crisis line also 24-7. The final one, the Kids Help Phone, as Tanya mentioned, many agencies received additional funding. Kids Help Phone was one of the agencies that did receive additional funding, so they have a very active online platform for students, uh, for youth to connect onto if they're looking for information and support, as well as for parents. So we encourage you to check those resources out. And we encourage you also to reach out for help if you're experiencing anything beyond which you feel you can't cope with on your own. So finally, this is who we are, and we've put our emails up here because we know that some of you may have questions that we can't get to today or may have suggestions that you'd like to share outside of this platform. So we encourage you to take down our emails. As I mentioned earlier, this presentation is being recorded and a copy of it will be made available. So if parents want to watch it or share it, they will be able to do that. And we will also include the PowerPoint with that. So if there are